Welcome to our next session, which is on copay accumulators and maximizers. In this session, you'll learn about how certain health insurance programs are causing patients to endure more out-of-pocket expenses and will help you understand what you can do about it. Our speakers are my colleagues, Chad Ramsey, Vice President of Policy at OCRA, and Vanessa Kramer, Director of Policy at OCRA. Thank you for joining us. Hello, I'm Chad Ramsey, uh, coming to you from Falls Church, Virginia today, here with my, uh, my, favorite, my favorite colleague, Vanessa Kramer. Say hello, uh, Vanessa. Hi there, I'm Vanessa Kramer, and I am joining you from Washington, DC today, and so pleased to have you here. Yes, um, we're gonna uh, go through a presentation here that we'll introduce in just one second. Um, we hope you'll find it informative. We also have some action items at the end that we hope that you'll be able to take. Um, and if you have questions throughout, uh, Vanessa and I have left our, uh, our email addresses at the end that you'll be able to see. You can respond to us directly. And I think that there will be a way for us to respond to you via chat because we'll be monitoring this live as well. So without further ado, this is the session that you're here for. So if you're not here for the copay accumulators and maximizers session, you should log out now. But all of you, I hope, will stay on so that we can talk through this really important topic. As I mentioned, I'm Chad Ramsey. I'm the uh, Vice President for Policy and uh, Advocacy here at uh, OCRA. And I've got with me Vanessa Kramer, who is the Policy Director. That's right. Thank you, Chad. Happy to be here. <laughs> All so let's right. go through the agenda. Vanessa, take it away. So to kick things off, we are going to do some level setting on key health insurance terms. I think this will be old hat for the vast majority of you, but just so we are all sort of operating from the same point of reference and going into this conversation, it's important um, to define these terms. Then we are going to actually, in, in, in defining key terms, we're going to define what copay accumulators and maximizers are, um, which of course is the title of our session. And while some of you may know, I'm sure a lot of you don't. I certainly didn't um, until several years ago. This is an emergent issue. Um, so we're all kind of learning as we go. But I should note that most importantly in that top bullet of level setting key terms is, of course, defining, um, you know, the purpose for today's session, copay accumulators and maximizers. So then we're going to look at some case studies. There are two examples in particular. The first is really basic, and then the second, things ratchet up a little bit. But I think it's always helpful, especially when talking about insurance, which is pretty dry, um, to use real life examples. And we'll try to do that kind of throughout to the ex best extent possible. Uh, then we're going to talk about how this ties to the larger issue of financial toxicity, um, briefly talk about that in our community, in the ovarian cancer community, and in the larger gynecologic cancer community. And then we are going to talk about what is being done about all of this, and specifically what is being done when it comes to copay assistance. Um, we have good policies and we have bad policies, and how we, OCRA, have joined with other organizations to organize and advocate around this issue. And along those lines, we've gotten some legislation introduced at the state level and at the federal level um, that we need your help getting some support on. So that's the last bullet there, which is where you come in. So we're looking at, you know, a tidy 45 minutes or so, but we have tried to really boil this topic down, which as I said at, at the outset is pretty dense, into kind of um, digestible bullets. So hopefully we did a good job doing that. Next slide, please. All right. So before diving into the substance of today's talk, which is, of course, copay accumulators and copay maximizers, we are going to back up, zoom out, if you will, and do some level setting on some key health insurance terms. 
So first and foremost is what you, you as the patient, we alternately and, and in health policy coverage, you see all of these terms bandied about interchangeably. We say you're either right, the patient, sometimes you're a healthcare consumer, you're a plan enrollee, you're a beneficiary, you're all of these things, but you are the patient. So what you as the patient or plan enrollee, plan beneficiary, when we're talking about insurance, pay toward your health plan. And most of us in this country, we get our health plans through our employer. Um, but because of the Affordable Care Act, there are now a few different options for coverage. Um, but again, the vast majority of this country is insured through their employer. So first bullet there, premium payments. This is the amount that health insurance companies charge each month for coverage. And if you are getting your insurance through your employer, all of this goes through your employer, of course. The employer contracts with an insurance company for a package for its employees, and you all are one risk pool, and that's how that works. The second is coinsurance payments. So the second two bullets are patients or payments that patients are subject to in real time over the course of the year, depending on their needs. So that first coinsurance payments. <clears throat> So this is a percentage that the beneficiary pays for services. It's a percentage of the total cost of that drug or service. And I'm going to give you an example in one second. And then to juxtapose that, we have copay, copayments, copay amounts. So copay amounts are also out-of-pocket costs that patients pay for a specific drug or service. A copay is fixed. So whatever, however often you go, wherever you go, as long as it's in network, and depending on what your plan looks like, and you can look at your insurance card and see what your copay amount is, this might be like $25, it might be $50, it's a fixed amount. Coinsurance, and this is the key difference between these two payments, coinsurance, right, is a percentage of the total cost of the service or drug. And so importantly, when we talk about some of these newer therapies that we're seeing uh, be developed and, and, and come to market under the precision medicine movement, this is really expensive, right? Like 20% or 30% of a drug that costs $10,000 a month quickly becomes cost prohibitive. So coinsurance is something to be, um, you know, mindful of um, just because, again, it is, it's subject to variation. Next slide, please. Whereas premium payments, and co-payments, those are fixed. Mm -hmm. All right, so another important buzz term, deductible. So what is your deductible? Your deductible is the amount you pay for covered services before your health insurance plan benefits start to pay. So this is before the plan benefits kick in. Plans with lower premiums, so lower monthly payments, generally have higher deductibles and vice versa. That kind of makes sense, right? Because if you have a higher premium, you've already paid in to care. So it makes sense, right, that it would be a lower threshold to meeting your deductible. So after you've hit your deductible, you usually pay only a co-payment or co-insurance for covered services. Your insurance company pays the rest. Family plans often have both an individual and a family deductible. Um, and then also another variation, of course, or another way it, 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 it parses apart is you have separate deductibles for prescription drugs and then for healthcare services. So then that last square there, a rectangle there, many plans pay for certain services, um, certain disease management programs before you've met your deductible. And the idea there, right, is for a health insurer, it, it benefits them to invest in preventive health um, because it's going to cost a lot less, you know, to be proactive than it is to treat something that has progressed and developed into a larger problem down the line. Right. So, so that means things like, you know, for a dental visit, an annual cleaning or um, um, a well woman visit or something, you know, along those lines that go along with prescribed um, traditional health care practices. Yes. So these are carved out of, of the deductible um, with the thinking being, again, that at the end of the day,
now it's it's money in their pocket to to encourage you to engage in prevention health and all of these good proactive maintenance visits. Next slide, please. All right. So that's your deductible. Now you're out of pocket. We OOP out of pocket maximum or limit, OOP limit, is the most you have to pay for covered services in a plan year before the insurance plan pays in full for whatever it is. So after you spend this amount on deductibles, co-payments, and co-insurance for in-network care and services, your health plan pays 100% cost of covered benefits. So the OOP limit doesn't include your monthly premium payments, anything you spend for services your plan doesn't cover, out of network care and services, or costs above the allowed amount for a service that a provider may charge. So the federal government sets limits on plans that fall within its jurisdiction each year. Um, so for plans offered in the marketplaces, this is the, the, the exchanges, the insurance exchanges that were created by the Affordable Care Act. There are state-based exchanges, federal-based exchanges. So you can see the plan limits there, that last bullet for 2022 plan year, the OOP limit is $8,700 for an individual and $17,400 for a family. And that gives yeah. you a flavor. That's kind of a good approximation across the market. So, you know, for people who do have, as, as most people do, plans through their employer, that's kind of a good approximation. In fact, oftentimes, you know, um, the plans, employer-sponsored plans are more generous. Right. And so that out-of-pocket out of maximum is meant to be a, a guard against financial toxicity. So that that's theoretically the most you would pay for all of your health insurance um, uh, payments for a year, apart from your premiums and anything outside of your network. So if your premium is $500 a month, um, then your out of pocket for the year would be 6,000 plus 8,700 for an individual. So that's 14,700. Um, theoretically, that would be the most you would spend on your health insurance coverage for the year. Unfortunately, um, there are some things that can take you over the as we go. All right. Enter in our raison d'etre for today's session. Um, what are copay assistance programs? And I guess actually maybe I jumped the gun a little bit because copay assistance programs will be our segue into copay accumulator programs. But with that background, having established those definitions, um, it's now we're going to shift gears and talk about copay assistance and copay accumulator programs. So, where do they fit into all of this? So, copay assistance is when patients are given financial assistance to help them reach their deductible or out of pocket maximum such that their health plan's benefits kick in. So this is a way to make out-of-pocket costs a lot more manageable for patients. So they're either paying nothing if they've hit their out-of-pocket max, if, if the financial assistance gets them to their out-of-pocket max, or if it gets them to their deductible, they're paying a smaller fraction of what they would be paying otherwise. And we're going to talk about real life examples in the next couple of slides. but. That second bullet there um, is important to highlight. Copay assistance is provided via a third party. So this is commonly pharmaceutical companies that manufacture whatever the drug is or charitable organizations. And when it's used, the insurance company is receiving dollar for dollar what it would if it were coming out of your pocket. It's just coming from elsewhere. And I apologize, there's an extra S on that slide there in that last bullet. But to back up, I don't know if we said this um, just as a matter of sort of clarifying and level setting. This is only, when we're, when we're talking about this, this is only for drugs. So only sort of for prescription drugs, other drug therapies, so as it pertains to our patient population, this comes into play when we talk about PARP inhibitors. A lot of patients are using copay assistance for PARP inhibitors, which can be very costly. So that's a great example 
Um, but the idea is <clears throat> it really, insofar as there is a donut gap created and patients would not be able to get the, to the deductible or their out-of-pocket max themselves, it prevents them from having to foot that bill, bridge that gap, um, and really hands it over to the insurers. <clears throat> For doing that, but that's great for our purposes because it enables patients to access these drugs. And we've got some case studies that we're going to talk about here in just a minute that will really um, crystallize this issue and make it clearer, I think. All right, so we defined copay assistance. Now we're going to talk about copay accumulator adjustment programs. So copay assistance is, of course, provided vis-a-vis -vis a copay assistance program. And as we said, these are often sponsored, are implemented by pharmaceutical companies or some sort of other charitable organization, cause mission-driven organization. So what are copay accumulator adjustment programs? or they are often called copay maximizers. We're seeing the terms used interchangeably. To be honest, I see more copay accumulator adjustment program used than copay maximizer, but it's important to be aware of. It's the same thing that we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> these are programs implemented by, oh, excuse me one second. I lost the slide here. Well, uh, well, okay, here we go. These these programs are implemented by health insurers in certain health plans, and they accept funding assistance provided via a third party, but they don't count those dollars toward a patient's or enrollee's annual deductible or out-of-pocket maximum limit. So this, in short, means that they might be taking that, that, that money. And in those cases, you know, that does amount to double dipping. And that's just a whole different thing that we sort of stay out of because the truth is, is that we understand their, their criticism of, of copay assistance programs, but our bottom line is patients. And that copay assistance is a critical source of access for patients. Um, so the copay accumulator programs are implemented by insurers and what they say is only money out of a patient's pocket counts toward an the patient's annual deductible or maximum out-of-pocket amount. And just the concept is troubling really when you think about that, when you think about um, a patient trying to pay for their drugs, you go to the drugstore and you're you're um, charged a hundred dollars for for a month supply of your drug. Um, it really shouldn't matter whether you um, have a hundred dollars in your pocket or whether um, Vanessa's behind me in line and she hands me fifty to cover the original the, the rest of the cost. Um, it shouldn't matter to the health insurer where that money is coming from as long as the bill is paid. That's right, Chad. And I do think it's important to highlight that no one is disputing, um, you know, that drug prices, especially for newer therapies, are prohibitively expensive and that something needs to happen there. Um, however, it seems like, you know, in these larger debates, it's the patients who sort of like suffer in the meantime, um, you know, pending a, a bigger, more meaningful reform. And we just want to be sure that that doesn't happen. Next slide, please. All right, so here is an example. And this example and the one that follows are pulled from a report that was issued in February of this year. And it is called Discriminatory Copay Policies Undermine Coverage for People with Chronic Illness. It is issued by the AIDS Report and this, or the AIDS Institute, excuse me. And this is part of a larger effort um, that is sponsored by a coalition of which OCRA is part of. And we will talk more about that in subsequent slides, but both of these examples are taken from this report. So to use all of these concepts in application, this example is that earlier is the amount of money that a patient has to pay before their um, insurance benefits kicks in in full. 
That is correct. Thank you, Chad. And um, so copay assistance is, of course, financial assistance provided via a third party that helps patients get to those better benefits. So without a copay accumulator adjustment policy, the $500 copay assistance will count toward the patient's deductible. So this means $1,000, right? minus $500 equals $500. The patient has to pay only the remaining $500 to reach their deductible. And that is, again, to access those benefits, the better benefits, that's that fixed cost of a copay or that coinsurance percentage. So with a copay accumulator adjustment policy, and remember it's Copay accumulator adjustment policies are bad. Copay assistance is good. It's like I, I feel like it's hard because those are both A words with double, double followed by double consonants. So I think it gets confusing there. Um, but so to return to this example, with a copay accumulator adjustment policy, the five hundred dollars in copay assistance will not count toward the patient's deductible, meaning that the patient would have to pay a thousand dollars out of their own pocket to reach their deductible and access that first tier of benefits. Next slide, please. All right, so that was softball. This example gets a lot more complicated. So you can see the details of this person's plan up above in that bar. And just to zoom in there, so the plan deductible is $4,600. And the out of pocket, the annual OOP maximum limit is $8,550. So the, those are the two sort of thresholds to bear in mind here. So someone is on medication that costs $1,680 a month and they get copay assistance that totals $7,200. So if you look, you can see a monthly breakdown of what the consumer pays on this plan and how, if you tick through it, right, how, um, copay assistance becomes a critical crutch over the course of the year. So for months one and two, right? So this is the top of the year, the top of the plan year, January and February. The consumer, so the patient or the plan enrollee or beneficiary pays nothing because copay assistance covers the meds in full. So then month three, Right, so March copay assistance amount is reduced. This brings the patient to the deductible, right? So it's they're still getting copay assistance, they're just getting less copay assistance because they don't require as much because they've already brought the patient or the plan enrollee to the deductible. Then months four, five, and six. So, the, what is this? The springtime here. We've got April, May, and June. Copay assistance amount is now co-insurance amount for meds. Again, that is because the deductible has been met. Once you reach your deductible, you get those breaks. That's co-insurance, right? Or that is a co-payment. Um, so we want to get you to the deductible. That's the idea of copay -assist, co assistance. And then further, getting you to that OOP max limit. So in month seven, copay assistance limit is reached. Patient pays the balance of the copay insurance amount. And this is a good time to highlight, right, that a lot of copay assistance programs are not infinite. You hit your limit. So depending on the program, you have to qualify for it. And this is why OCRA is pretty clear in its position that we, this is not a permanent solution. This is temporary, but it's it's a critical temporary mm -hmm. bridge. Um, but you know you have to qualify for this assistance, and you have to renew your qualification each year, and then it's not unlimited. So month seven, but importantly, you can see, especially through this example, how important it is, um, in spite of the fact that it is finite. Month seven, so copay assistance limit is reached and the patient pays the balance of the coinsurance amount. So in July, the patient for the first time and in the year is subject to a $760 payment. That's pretty great, you know, considering the alternative. So then month eight, and mind you, all the way, all this time, even though, you know, it's not being paid OOP from the patient, all of these payments are being counted toward the OOP limit, the patient's OOP limit. 
So then uh, month eight, we have the patient pays the balance of the coinsurance amount to get them to their OOP maximum. And then the patient is subject from Sept for September, October, November, and December for four months. The, the remaining four months of the year, the patient is subject to absolutely nothing. So when it's all said and done, the patient pays, right, $1,350. They get $7,200 in copay assistance, right? And that takes them to that, that really important number, that second bullet there, their annual out-of-pocket maximum amount. And then after that, you know, insurance kicks in 100%. Patient does not pay anything out-of-pocket. And so we're about to show you um, the, the second example of of um, what this looks like with uh, a copay accumulator program and the impact. But I just want to linger a little um, for a moment or two longer so you can look at this, see that the patient will pay a um, little over $1,300, um, but that only comes in July and August. So um, take note of that before we get over to the next slide. Yeah, I'm glad you did that, Chad, because it's a lot of information. It's a lot to look at. And I do think it's important to sink in to understand the shock value and the yeah. meaning of this next slide. So remember what we talked about, what the patient was subject to. So this is the exact same plan details. The top bar is just repeated up there for handy reference. But that exact same scenario here. So if there were to be a copay accumulator adjustment program or a copay maximizer in that same plan, and this you know, copay assistance, third-party assistance were not to count toward those the out-of-pocket spending limits, then this is what it would look like. If we look at the two, the big box here, we have what the insurer collects. So the insurer is going to collect, right? You can see this is a great example of what the insurer collects in either way. And what when you look at the circles there, you can compare them, right? So this is what the patient is subject to. So the patient in, in a scenario like this where a copay accumulator adjustment program is implemented, that patient will have to pay $7,900 versus $1,350. So that's the difference. It's about, it's more than what $6,000 is what we're talking about in this particular plan. And this plan is not, um, you know, I mean, it's kind of a great baseline because you guys may recognize through your own plans, you know, a $5,000 deductible is pretty common. This plan is set at $4,600. Um, so this plan is not out of the realm of possibilities. In fact, to the contrary, it is a good sort of general um, uh, baseline. And so that differential is powerful. And then you can also see, you know, to our earlier point, when we said that the insurer, when copay assistance, or third-party assistance is used, the insurer is still collecting money. You can see in this scenario how the insurer does collect a lot more money because, you know, in this sort of situation, they would be double dipping, collecting monies twice for something. Yeah. And when you think about um, two things, one, um, in this, under this scenario, the patient isn't paying um, anything for their drugs for only four months, January, February, March, and April. Um, and then um, you really start to see this big impact on out-of-pocket in May, June, July. And that, that's what we're starting to hear um, is, is that, you know, without being um, adequately ex explained, without the, the program being sort of laid out to patients, where they're finding that their um, monthly bills are changing and they're not sure why. And this is um, a pretty concrete example of, of how that can happen. So I'm just gonna go back one time, one slide again to look at the consumer, what the consumer, what the patient is paying on a monthly basis. Um, I think too, um, just because I don't think it was totally clear, the last bullet is important to highlight in this plan example when we're talking about what the patient is paying because mm -hmm. that, 
That cost sharing for specialty tier prescription, I think that that is most applicable to our patient base because that, of course, is PARP inhibitors. You're not going to CVS to get those. You're going mm -hmm. to a specialty pharmacy. And so that 50% coinsurance amount is not uncommon. Um, so, you know, and that applies, right? Your coinsurance or your copayment amounts apply after your deductible has been met. And then it's just right. your home free after that out of pocket maximum limit has been met. But I just think that that's important to highlight in, in this example. Cause that's yes. I, But as you can see here, the out of pocket, um, maximum hasn't even been reached yet by the end of the year and patients are still paying that 50% coinsurance um, even at the end of the year. And um, that means a lot more money out of the patient's um, pocketbook. Um, and that's really troubling, especially when you don't know to budget for something like that. Um, when that plan isn't clear um, that it isn't accepting third, part, third party um, um, copay assistance. So that's that's really problematic, and it's some, it's why we're doing the session today. That's right. All right. So as we continue to tease this out, a couple of things, or a few things rather, there's no debate that drug prices are high and rising too high at a rate faster than any other in the healthcare sector, and it's not sustainable. Congress has long been working on major drug pricing reform legislation that aims to address some of the underlying issues that are driving this trend. In the meantime, copay assistance provides a critical bridge or access point, but does nothing to lower the list price of drugs or meaningfully address the underlying issues which insurers see as a get around, hence they're biting back with copay accumulator adjustment programs. And we included this slide, I think it's important to note because people would ask why on earth would insurers be implementing these plans? How does this make sense? Um, you know, and it isn't because, you know, anyone's evil or to malign anyone. It's really just a matter of these drugs are very expensive. And they, like the pharmaceutical companies, they're a business too. Um, and so it's all about cost saving. And they don't want to be in the position where they are forced to sort of prop up or subsidize what they feel are inflated drug prices. Well, and, you know, uh, Vanessa mentioned PARP inhibitors. And as many of you know, um, they're they're quite expensive. Um, you're looking at a monthly cost um, for PARP inhibitors sometimes be twelve or thirteen thousand um, dollars as a list price, and so um, the presence of copay accumulator programs for something like that. Imagine you have to pay your fifty percent coinsurance on a twelve thousand dollar therapy. That's six thousand dollars a month. That's um, not really sustainable for for um, any patient. Um, so um, uh, we understand that uh, drug prices are very high and have been, re have been rising far too quickly as we noted earlier, um, but this is something that is critical for patients. We just wanna make sure that folks are able to gain access to these life-saving therapies um, and access is the most critical thing. And we, we're gonna get into a little bit about what can happen when people are struggling to pay for these um, drugs moving forward. All right, and this is to put all of this into context. Chad, actually, to pick up on that thread, what can happen, um, you know, the impact to patients um, around this issue. We're going to talk about that in the next few slides. So copay assistance programs are an important relief, a Band-Aid, you know, we acknowledge, as, as we've mentioned previously, not a permanent fix, um, but an important bridge that ease financial toxicity for today's patients. So cost and treatment or the cost of treatment and care is high and rising and increasingly these costs are being passed on to patients in the form of higher monthly premium payments, deductibles and co-insurance and co-payment rates. Now, importantly, the landmark affordable 
Hair Act of 2014, or that was implemented in 2014, provided a lot more people with health insurance coverage. But the devil is in the details, as it always is. And there are a lot of skimpy plans out there. Um, so even though so many more Americans, you know, an estimated 12 Point one more Americans are insured. Um, a lot of people are facing shortcomings within, um, you know, their plans and 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 sort of experiencing coverage gaps. And when we talk about anti-cancer therapies, um, we also often talk about their level of toxicity and what uh, what patients can endure, um, and ensuring that the toxicity isn't too high, such that the drug does more harm than good. Um, but an equally important type of toxicity is financial toxicity. And we've been talking about that for several years now as drug prices and other sorts of prices in the healthcare system have made gaining access to the best quality coverage unreachable to some people. And so that's why we're shining a light again on financial toxicity um, and the impact that it can have on people trying to get the best therapy and having the best outcomes to their cancer journey. Well, and of course, how this all links to the today's topic of copay assistance is copay assistance programs are critical to ensuring or mitigating financial toxic mitigating financial toxicity or ensuring patients don't experience it. So that's how it all sort of connects. Um, but financial toxicity, I think a lot of you are probably familiar with this term, but it describes the negative impact medical expenses can have on patients in terms of their health related quality of life, leading to negative mental and physical effects, as well as in some cases, bankruptcy, loss of job or income, or even homelessness. So this, of course, and I think a lot of us can relate to this, um, is, is, speaks to the extreme distress um, that financial issues and bankruptcy and everything else, what, what, whatever, you know, can have and how, you know, in many cases, especially if you're sick, that can reverse your progress. So how do we measure financial toxicity? So it's measured using hard metrics like out-of-pocket costs, lost productivity, debt, bankruptcy, as well as more subjective measures, um, you know, they get it sort of psychological measures, anxiety, depression, um, you know, stress, et cetera. Next slide, please. All right, so to double click on that, financial toxicity is especially pronounced in our community. That's because ovarian cancer it, and, and gynecologic cancers are more expensive to treat than other cancers. So there's been lots of great literature on this. Um, we included for today's purposes, three different studies. Um, the first of which you can see the key findings are included in the blue box here. Um, so it found that nearly half of patients with gynecologic cancer reported experiencing moderate to severe financial toxicity. And importantly, this was a 2021 study. So nearly hot off the presses just from last year. Um, but younger patients were at greater risk of experiencing financial toxicity. I think that's no surprise given they've had less time to accrue um, savings. So, and then the last bullet there, patients reported severe financial toxicity. Patients reporting severe financial toxicity accounted for 15% of those surveyed. And, you know, I think that the second study um, on the right sheds light as to why that is. It is because ovarian cancer in particular is one of the more expensive cancers to treat. The average cost of care during the first year is $100,000. Um, most patients have to pay for 3% of that themselves. Of course, you know, that speaks to some of the things we just discussed, um, you know, whatever their OOP costs were, depending on their deductibles um, and OOP maximum limits, et cetera. But yeah, and I think it's also important to note that that um, study is five years old. Um, and, um, you know, in five years, a lot has happened in the, the health system. That's a great system. point. And especially um, when it comes to therapies, which is really right. kind of what we're talking about, drug therapies. There, there's a lot new. There's a there's a lot of new indications for therapies as well that can can look can extend those costs um, year over year. Um, and so this one hundred thousand dollars that's the year immediately after surgery. Um, and so um, you can imagine as um, you know 
new sort of maintenance therapies and other things become available um, that are doing a good job for outcomes, um, but they are very expensive and they, um, they, they mean that those costs will continue year over year. That's right, Chad. All right, and then the last study here. So this again gets at how well we may be, you know, more insured. The devil is in those details. A 2019 study finds that even with relatively high incomes and excellent health insurance coverage, women diagnosed with gynecologic cancers are still at risk for significant financial toxicity. And then the highlighted, the last bullet there that's highlighted and has three asterisks, um, you know, that really gets to the impact of all of this. We can talk about, you know, bankruptcy and psychological distress and other things, but as far as how it impacts treatment um, and someone's progress toward recovery or how it impedes their progress toward recovery, it's really alarming um, that this study found that patients with financial high financial toxicity were 7.3 times more likely to avoid uh, or delay care than those with less financial toxicity. So that goes to show um, that this is really a, a matter of, of life or death in many ways, um, the issue of financial toxicity. It's so sobering to think about that choice that some um, patients have to make, whether they're going to you know, pay for their, their drugs this month or pay for rent. Um, and no one should have to make that decision. Um, we know um, in ovarian cancer, missing um, a month of therapy can have really bad outcomes. Um, and, and no one should really uh, ever have to make that choice. And so we're trying to guard against that with the policies that we support. So our bottom line is, as a mission-driven organization committed to patient advocacy, we strongly believe in policies and initiative that ease the cost-sharing burden for patients. So this is whatever form that assistance takes or that relief takes. And in this particular conversation, it's it takes the form of copay assistance. So because we strongly support copay assistance programs, um, it follows then that we we strongly oppose efforts to undermine them or limit their use. And so we oppose copay accumulator or maximizer programs. Next slide, please. So what's being done about all of this? That was a ton of background. So in the, in the words of Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, right? Don't agonize, organize. So on the policy and advocacy front, what are we doing? So the AIDS Institute, of course, this is an issue, right, that doesn't just affect ovarian cancer. In fact, I think we've made like only an utterance of ovarian cancer really once so far in this conversation. That's because it affects anyone who is on high cost drugs, right? High cost drugs for chronic illnesses or diseases. So that means they're not episodic, that patients are on them, you know, in many cases for the duration of their lives. So because this is so wide and far reaching in its impact and scope, a, a coalition has organized. And this coalition has over 100 organizations, including us. It also has, of course, like multiple sclerosis, ALS, HIV AIDS organizations, any disease where the cost of drugs is particularly particularly high, they have a dog in this fight. So the All Copays Count Coalition is led by the AIDS Institute. We are part of it. Um, and we formed, when did we form, Chad? I want to say maybe three or four years ago? Well, it's had, we've had a few different names over the years, but, um, but that it, it's been in the works for probably five years now. Okay. So importantly, um, they issued, and this is available on the AIDS Institute's website, uh, but the coalition issued a report and it was really the AIDS Institute that drove this um, earlier this year that detailed the issue. Um, and what this report did was it reviewed individual market plans offered through the Affordable Care Act created marketplaces. So offered through the state and federal based exchanges, right? 
and it looked to see if copay accumulator programs were included in those plans and whether or not they were disclosed, um, you know, as part of the information um, about the plan that was available. So next slide, please. So findings on prevalence. So in 35 states, so this is according to their review, and this is the report was released in February of 2022. Highly encourage everyone to check it out. Um, great background on this issue. And of course, it details um, these findings that we're just going to quickly gloss over. But in 35 states, there's at least one plan with a copay accumulator adjustment policy. So that's nothing to sneeze at. In the majority of states, you know, there there is, there are these, these plans are on the market. Uh, in eight states, every plan includes a copay accumulator adjustment policy. So take a look at these states. We have Alabama, Arkansas, Delaware, Idaho, Indiana, Iowa, Montana, and South Carolina. If you get a plan, a health plan through the marketplace, be aware of this. Every plan includes, according to this review, a copay accumulator adjustment policy. Again, if you, re if, if you depend on the market places for your coverage and live in one of these states, be aware of this. Feel free to reach out to Chad or me and we can kind of talk about this and resources to help you along the way. Um, but in 30 states, at least half of all plans include a copay accumulator adjustment policy. And I won't rattle off all of those states, but again, the point of the story is that these policies are commonplace in certain in certain markets when it comes to health plans um, in certain states and they are proliferating so it's definitely something to be aware of so then the second column there in five states one third or fewer plans have a copay accumulator policy so you know you're safer if you live in massachusetts mississippi new york north dakota and pennsylvania those are the five states where we only see the copay accumulators in a third or fewer plans and then that last bullet there in only three states plus dc none of the plans include a copay accumulator adjustment policy so that's great and these three states are hawaii maryland and new jersey and then that red box is really kind of the sizzle and the steak and gets to the policy piece of what we do when we say we are the policy and advocacy department so 12 states, when this report was issued, 12 states plus Puerto Rico had passed laws prohibiting copay accumulator policies and plans regulated by the state's health insurance departments. So this is really, these laws are all things that OCRA fought for and advocated for at the state level. We signed on to various letters, um, but we are pro such laws. And Really, um, generally speaking, what the laws do is they say to the insurers, you cannot discriminate on the basis of funding source as long as you're receiving your money dollar for dollar. Um, so we feel those are fair. And again, those are something that we are, are, are supportive of. Next slide, please. Well, just, just to, be, to make you aware, we do say 12 states uh, plus Puerto Rico. And as we're about to mention, there are a couple more actually, but we lo accidentally lopped off a couple of the states there. So I'll just read them off so you know which ones, according to the AIDS Institute, had the, um, the policies. And it's Arkansas, Arizona, Connecticut, Georgia, Illinois, Connecticut, Louisiana, Oklahoma, North Carolina, Tennessee, West Virginia, and Virginia. So just wanted you to be aware so you didn't think our math was poor. Well, next slide, please. So the report, right, was issued in February of this year. Um, since it appears that two additional states have passed laws. And so this map highlights the complete list of states. If, if the state is colored in blue, then it has passed a law to protect use of, of copay assistance for drugs. And so again, take a look is, at that. It's a visual of the list that Chad just rattled off. But again, take a look, let it seep in, recognize where you are in all of this. 
And really, I should say, if you've, you know, if you're in one of these blue states, this whole session is a little bit less relevant to you, right? Because your state has already taken that important action. If we had our druthers, the entire map would be blue to indicate that all states have passed laws to protect the use of copay assistance. Next slide. All right, so that's at the state level. And insurance is ever so complicated, right? Health insurance is, it's, you know, juris, some plans are regulated at the state level and some plans are regulated by the federal government. So whenever you want a complete reform, right? Typically you have to pursue kind of this dual path of state level and federal level reforms. So we just talked about what was happening at the state level. Um, but of course, right, the state only regulates certain health plans. Federal government regulates other health plans. So what's happening at the federal level? So a regulatory rule that was finalized under the Trump administration allows health insurance companies to use copay accumulator adjustment policies at their discretion even when even where there is no medically appropriate generic drug available. Um, so in short, this means that for plans that are on the federal exchange, right, and through the, that, that, that were created or available through the marketplace created by the Affordable Care Act, that these plans can have copay accumulator policies. Um, this was something that we signed on to letters and fought against, but unfortunately, this rule was finalized. And unfortunately, to the second bullet, it has yet to be reversed. So this rule is still in a effect. And it's this very rule, right, um, that made it such that the AIDS Institute completed the report that reviewed all of the plans available on the marketplace. Um, so, you know, to really show the impact and the scope of this rule. Next slide, please. All right, so that's what's happening, right? Like, you know, at the regulatory level, um, when we talk about the federal government, let's talk about Congress. Um, so we know that the administration through regulatory means made it such that copay accumulator programs are available in exchange plans. Now Congress, in Congress, there is a bipartisan proposal uh, bipartisan legislation that would reverse this decision, um, which is something that OCRA is behind and the whole coalition, uh, all copays count coalition is actively lobbying for. But in short, the bill requires copay assistance be counted toward out of pocket cost sharing requirements and closes a loophole that permits insurers to deem certain drugs non essential for which no cost sharing paid will count toward the deductible or out-of-pocket maximum. So it really resolves, the long and short of it is, is that it fixes the issue that we're talking about. Um, and it does so legislatively, which amounts to a more permanent fix for our purposes. So we really like this bill. Mm -hmm. It currently has 56 co-sponsors, so four Republicans and 52 Democrats. And it was introduced in the House in November of last year. Next slide, please. Here you can see this is representative. He is the main co the main sponsor of, of the legislation. Here is his press release. And I just want to read the bottom paragraph there because I think it gets to all of all of this. Um, so historically, when a patient has utilized cost sharing assistance at the pharmacy counter, the amount has counted towards a patient's deductible and maximum out of pocket limit, thereby lowering patients overall out of pocket spending. In June 2020, former Trump administration HHS secretary finalized the 2021 Notice of Benefit Parameter Rule, reversing that policy and allowing insurers to adopt copay accumulator adjustment programs. I just think it's important to see how everyone's kind of framing this because it is sort of a sticky wicket. Um, but it is such a critical issue. I would encourage you to read this press release if it is of interest. And a couple of things. Um, where we are in the Congress, we are in the second session of, or the second year of the congressional session. Congressional sessions are two years long. So more likely than not, this bill, 
because we're in the second year because it's an election year. So members of Congress are spending a lot of time back at home campaigning. Um, and the new congressional session is sworn in in January of next year. So you, we only have maybe like a four month window to get this bill passed. More likely than not, it will not get passed. However, it's really, really important because of everything else going on, all the competing other issues, it's an election year and it's just a very short window. However, it behooves us to be prepared to hit the ground running when the new congressional session is sworn in in January and be sure the gears are greased to get traction and to actually advance the legislation. Well, and the other thing that's important to note is that Congress still has a lot of work left to do this year. They have to finalize budgets for next year um, for just about every uh, part of government. Um, and there's an election coming up, as Vanessa noted, in uh, November. We don't know what's going to happen in that election. We don't know if, if who's going to have control or retain control of either house of Congress. And so it's possible that there will be a flurry of activity at the end of this Congress. Um, and you will see different types of things, different types of policy proposals get attached to other bills. So why that's important is because you need to have a large amount of representation of co-sponsors on legislation like this in order for it to be considered in an environment like that. So um, it's really helpful, not only if we move on to next Congress um, to have a large number of a, a large amount of support for this bill, but in this Congress, um, getting people um, put, to put their marker in the sand on this issue is critically important um, if you want it to be considered. So yeah. your action is really important. Yeah, I guess to put a bow on it, right? Like I, Chad's a little bit more optimistic than I am, but two things come, right? We really need this final push for co-sponsors because two things come of it. Either it sets us up to hit the ground running for next congressional session, or to Chad's point, you know, there is a possibility, right? That it could be taken up or rolled into some sort of end of the year package or moved otherwise, but either way, it's we're sitting pretty and that, that's what we want. We wanna draw attention to this bill and we need your help in doing that. All right, so quick summary so far. So copay accumulator adjustment programs limit use of third-party financial assistance, specifically copay assistance for drugs. Such assistance is a vital source of financial assistance for patients on costly drug therapies. So again, this doesn't just apply to ovarian cancer patients, it's anyone who requires costly drug therapies. Copay accumulator adjustment programs are becoming increasingly prevalent in health plans and their impact is not being effectively communicated to effective patients. 14 states have enacted laws protecting use of copay assistance and there's a bill in Congress to do the same. This is the bill sponsored by Representative Donald McEachin, HR 5801. Next slide. And this takes us to our calls to action of which there are three. So the first is to complete the action alert for Representative McEachin's bill. So this is HR 5801. I think it's called the Help Copays Act. Yes. Yes. And we have set up on our website a, an action alert. It's very easy. You just have to fill out a couple of fields and it automatically sends it to, it automatically sends your message to your congressional office. At the same time, you can also personalize the language if you're so inclined, but you don't even have to do that. Everything auto populates. So action number two is figure out whether or not your state has enacted legislation around copay assistance or accumulator programs by reading and by reading, really skimming, um, the AIDS Institute report. It's great, it's detailed, um, but really just importantly, see where you fall um, in, in this issue and, and, and be aware of it, it's important. Number three, share your story of copay assistance and its valuable role in making life-saving drugs more accessible with your elected official. 
you know, truthfully, grassroots advocacy, the constituent voice, it has the most impact in election years. It's just how it goes. Elected officials are trying more than ever to curry good favor. So you have your elected officials ear at the state level, at the federal level, especially if they're in cycle, um, you know, campaigning. So really, if you can, if you can sort of grab grab their ear, if you can get traction, if you do have the opportunity to communicate, or if there is a touch point, really talk about this issue. We need to cast a spotlight on it. And I will say it is not the sort of most exciting issue, which makes it ever the more complicated in getting through. And it's also, it's further complicated by virtue of the fact that a lot of patients don't realize they might be using copay assistance, so they might not realize they're impacted. So it's this particularly challenging um, space for us, and we really welcome your help in, in, in elevating it and raising visibility around it. I think a number four would be um, you know, to find out about your own plan. Um, you can certainly um, reach out to your benefits manager or your, your health insurance company to talk about your plan. Knowing whether it has something like this in it is important. It will help you budget and help you make decisions. Perhaps you're in, the, you're in an opportunity for open enrollment where you're um, looking to choose a new plan. You know, finding out whether or not something like this is included in your and your plan is important. And so asking those questions, um, do you know copay assistance count towards my deductible and my out-of-pocket costs? You know, you can ask that those questions before you enroll into a new health insurance plan. And so we would encourage you to do so. Definitely. So that's it. We've reached the end of this um, presentation. Thank you so much for attending. Um, we hope that um, you uh, learned something. And, and if you already knew everything that we talked about, we hope that you'll take action at least um, and reach out to your members of Congress, um, look into your own state laws and your own health insurance plans to see how you're impacted. But if you do have any uh, questions, please do not hesitate at all to reach out to Vanessa or me. And you can see our email addresses are here. Um, any last words, Vanessa? No, thank you. Thank you. Thanks to everyone who attended. Thank you again. And um, we hope that you en enjoy the rest of the conference. And um, we, we, again, um, look forward to talking to you in the future. So thank you very much.